Thank you for joining us wherever you are. This podcast episode is brought to you by the Old Ways Actual Play Team. This actual play uses the 5th edition Vampire the Masquerade tabletop role-playing rules by World of Darkness. This actual play is performed by adults and in an adult setting. Listeners should know that this podcast is intended for a mature audience and will include strong language and mature themes. All content, including names, places, events, companies, and so forth, that may bear resemblance to entities living, dead, or undead, is strictly coincidental. My name is Rena Henze, and for tonight's game, I will be your storyteller. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Old Ways Podcast, Vampire the Masquerade Chronicle, Shards of San Francisco. I am your storyteller, Storyteller Rena, and tonight, well, where there's smoke, there's fire. Quite literally. So before we get into the ashes of last, ni- of last time's episode, uh, I'd like to thank all of you, our listeners, and especially our Patreon supporters, for all that you do for us. We literally could not run this show without you. If you would like to support us through Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash the old ways podcast. We really appreciate you and everything that you give. And now let's get on to some introductions to my right. Hi, this is Mike, and I play Marcus Voss of Clan Bruja. And do you smell that? Smells like victory and fire. And next to Mike, we have. Hi, I'm John. I'm playing Sylvester LaViolette, and I am getting a little help from my friends. You are. You still have some, surprisingly. And next to John. Hi, my name is Tegan, and I'm playing Rom the Shaman, and I'm going to a dinner party. That you did not plan for. It's great. And next to Tegan, we have... Hi. This is Ali, and I play Katerina Bogdanovic of Clan Toreador. We are once again missing our beloved Hikata, Alex Giovanni, so tonight I will say last, but never least. Hello, hello, my name is Bridget, and I am playing Monica West of Clan Salubri. And you have no idea what's coming your way. Yeah, she never does. So, (laughs) speaking of coming your way, so you've taken Annalise on a shopping spree at the Gap. Uh, She's been running around initially just pulling things off shelves in excitement, but now she's, she calmed down eventually, figured out sizing. She got her first pair of jeans, which she was very excited about and didn't know what to do with initially. But you have loaded her up with an entire new wardrobe. Thanks to your ghoul, Natalia, who is also a stylist. And as you pay with Daddy's black card, mm-hmm. you get a text with an image file attached. Mm, who's the sender? Jean. Ooh, her heart sinks for just a moment, but she will open the attachment. So the text just says, go home. Katarina just brought this by. And she sends you a blurry, slightly blurry picture of what looks like a missing poster with Annalise's face on it. Wow, I thought her heart had dropped before, but nope, nope, there's a new depth to this. She's staring at the phone as everything is getting bagged up. Uh, She's going to look down at Annalise. She's going to look at the phone. Uh, She's going to pinch the bridge of her nose as she tries to reconcile who has a picture of Annalise, who would be looking for it, because... I mean, if you're in the society, you probably know where she is right now from the Elysium meeting. So who and she thinks and um, she's not really paying attention to her surroundings. And I think she's going to look down to Annalise right there in that moment and say in German. Mm, she wants to, but she can't. But she's going to go still. She's going to go very chill. Uh, and she is going to try to wrap that up uh, as quickly as she can. And she's going to text back, Jean, we're on our way. And then she's going to forward that image to Chase. You forward that image to Chase, and he just responds with, meet you in the territory with our dinner guest. Because Petty always trumps panic, he's going to get another thumbs up. Yeah, so she'll very hurriedly get Annalise um, into the car um, and get back home as quickly as possible. Annalise 
as you load her into the car, just kind of cocks her head and looks at you. Are, are you driving or do you have someone driving you? No, Monica typically drives herself. Okay. So you see Annalise looking at you from the back of the car. She can't sit up front because she's eight. But she's looking at you through the rear view, uh, in the rear view mirror and she goes, what's wrong? And Monica's going to flick her eyes up and look back at her. And she's going to hand her the phone. She looks at the phone. What? Who's looking for you, Annalise? Maybe the people who killed Mama? So I know we haven't talked about that, but could you give me a crash course, please? Because whoever is looking for you is mobilizing both kindred and kind to find you. That's a really bad combination for us. When we get to the house, I I, I don't want to talk about it in here. And she suddenly looks really deflated. Monica is going to take her phone back, and she is not going to push that for now. She is really heartbreaking or heartbroken that such an awesome evening just got ruined by that one singular text. You drive in silence. Annalise is now clutching Annika and Annika too. Both of them. And staring out the window. But you get back to the house in the territory, the one that you left behind a few nights ago. Next to the Lasombra party house. And you take Annalise inside with her bags of clothes and She goes and she sits down on the couch. She sets her dolls down carefully next to her. And she puts her hands in the pockets of her new jeans. She seems very excited by pockets momentarily and then deflates again. It was very scary. There was fire. And fire's really not good. But there was... Everything went dark in the house. Which is not supposed to happen because Mama and I put up wardings with blood. You probably knew that. And and they're supposed to keep people out. Kindred aren't are able to get in without permission, usually, unless they're other Tremere. And kind don't see the house at all. They just sort of glance over it. I don't know the word. It's like they see it, but they don't see it. Mama said it keeps us safe. Kept us safe. And everything went really dark, and we couldn't see anything. Anything. And she looks at you very, very intently. And Mama Mama tried to turn on lights and, and light candles, and we couldn't see anything. And Mama got panicked and she said I needed to go hide. We had a little spot that she made in my room. We always had spots like that just in case because there was one time, well, you don't want to hear about that, but I didn't want to because I didn't want to leave my mama. And, And then there was suddenly, there was smoke. And Mama was yelling about someone had scratched off the blood on the doors and on the windows. And she said I needed to go. And then there was some fire from the Mama's library. You can always tell where fire's coming from when you're when you're a vampire, because it's scary. And and then we could see a little bit, but the lights were still off. And there was I went to my room so I could hide because mama was yelling and and I saw I saw these people that mama was fighting but it was like she couldn't see she 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 was looking around and she couldn't see me and she was trying to do something to one of the humans because it was humans in the house but she couldn't see them they did something I didn't know humans could do that And there was a tall lady with a sword. I thought humans didn't use those anymore, but she had it. And Mama was yelling and and she was yelling in German. And and so I went and I hid in my little hole. And I was very quiet. 
but the blood was still on, on the hole, so I don't think they could see me. And I waited until it was quiet, and then I got up, and I went downstairs, and Mama was there, but her head wasn't there. And, 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 and I, I, I got really scared. And so I, I, I went to find Sebastian because it was the only safe place I had to go. During the duration of this story, Monica would be moving closer and closer into her. At some point, the girl is probably just going to be full blown into her lap. Maybe the, if they knew about Mama, then they probably knew about me, right? Yeah, that's what it looks like. So, I can't go outside again, can I? Monica pauses. We'll figure it out. What Monica's thinking is, we are so fucked. This is a corner I don't think we can get out from beneath. We are so fucked. But what she's going to say is, we'll figure it out. We've been in tight positions before. You have survived much worse than this. I give you my word. We'll figure it out. Okay. As you as you finish up this conversation with Annalise, who is now sitting in your lap, clutching both of her dolls, you hear a car pull up into the driveway. No, she's going to spring to her feet and go look out the window because that's the safe thing to do. Yep. You go to the window. It's got very heavy curtains on it, right, to block out mm-hmm. sunlight, but also to make it harder for people to see that anyone's here or who is here and you just sort of peek around one of the curtains and you see Chase's driver from when he's in in the city get out open the door Chase gets out straightening his tie and then there's a pause the driver does not go around to the other side of the car and then the car door almost reluctantly opens and you see Rom the shaman stumbling out of the back of the car. So that's what you see, Monica. If her heart could sink one more level right now, it would. Because usually when he says, hey, I'm bringing somebody home for dinner, that's somebody that they're going to eat. She really doubts they're getting ready to eat Rom. She has no idea why Rom would be at this house right now. But the wheels are spinning very quickly. So, Rom, you are, you have been driven back into Marcus's territory. And thinking maybe going to go back to your boat, but no. The car has taken a few twists and turns, and you find yourself on a very quiet street with uh, one fairly large house next to a smaller bungalow, and the car pulls up into the driveway. The driver does not open your door. You have to open it yourself. And you slide out of the car. And there's a tall, lanky, red-haired somewhat nervous looking person in front of the house feeding a bunch of cats and he just sort of waves well come on it's dinner time I'll follow because these guys have obviously seen too many movies and they're like you know being all circumspect with their information it's fine I'm here you are here so Monica, you see Chase walking up to the door next to Rom, so Rom can't bolt. <laughs> I'm not bolting. I'm here. She knows that escort. Mm-hmm. She does. And he puts his key in the lock, opens the door, and says, Monica, darling, I'm sure you remember our friendly neighborhood shaman. hey And Rom, you see Monica, who you know, And a very creepy small child holding a doll with a broken face and an identical doll with an unbroken face sitting on the couch. No, no, but I've met this one. I met the tiny one. Yes, just she's (laughs) she's wearing different clothes now and she's got a second doll. That's cool. Can I like, am I allowed to address the small child? Yes, she's just staring at you with those big blue eyes. It is worth noting the second you walked in, Monica's hips would have shifted where there's at least a direct line of sight where you can't see her directly or approach her on a straight line. Monica probably doesn't even realize she did it. No, that's fine. Like, she just got new clothes, so this is the first time seeing her in, like, normal fucking clothes. Yeah. All right, what is she wearing? 
jeans and a t-shirt with a unicorn on it. With a unicorn on it? Oh my God. Okay, yeah, no, I'm totally getting down and I'm just gonna be like, I'm getting down on on their height level. And be, I'm just gonna say like, those look absolutely fantastic on you. You made fantastic choices here. I particularly like the unicorn. Everything that you did is amazing. You look great. Thanks. All right, cool. I'll stand up. Hi, Monica. How you doing? Why am I here? That's a great question, Chase. Chase, why are we here? Chase is going to just kind of fold his hands and smile benevolently. You know that smile, Monica. Yeah, she's getting ready to get fucked. And not in the fun way from like a couple nights ago. Chase carefully locks the door, closes the curtains, says, well, Rom here is going to help us with the after effects of our, well, our little experiment the other night. Rom, I've come to understand you have some skill in replacing memories, or at least covering them up. The moment you brought me in here, it was going to be some memory replacing crap. I knew this. Ugh. You're Who, so smart. Whose memories are 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 you are you wanting to replace? He inclines his head at Monica. Monica takes a step back. She genuinely looks scared in this moment. Is this a consensual mind wiping? I'm sure you don't want to be going through the rest of your unlife with the child's horrible memories, Monica. She is going to throw a very polite smile at Ram and then look back at him and say in tomorrow, you didn't think this was something that we should have discussed first? No. All right, when you do that, I can't understand what you're saying. And if I don't consent? Do you want me to make it in order? Uh, she pulls her arms across her chest, holding her elbows uh, as she kind of like slightly caves in on herself and she takes another step back. There are other ways to do this. They might take more time, but I don't want them in my head scrambling me around. This is something we should have talked about, Chase. He smiles slightly. I just want what's best for you. What's best for me or what's best for you? Aren't we one? Chase, not when you go around making decisions like this on my behalf. This wasn't a unified discussion. This wasn't a, and she doesn't realize it, but she's backing up further and further away from him. Monica, I stepped in for you. You could have been lost in that child's mind forever. Is this what this is? You're punishing me? No, you're taking on the child's memories was not supposed to happen. It happened because you weren't strong enough to perform the ritual yourself when I told you you weren't strong enough. And now you're taking on a Tremere child's memories is also hurting me because don't you think I have some of those fragments now, too? Monica? She's going to look at him with all three eyes. She bites her bottom lip and she... She nods because she understands. She understands what he's saying. She gets it. And then she looks to Rom and almost blurts it out. I don't consent. No matter what I say from this point, I don't consent. Chase tilts his head. You can give the order now. As if I'd do that. You've made it perfectly clear where you stand. You can leave the room now. She is going to give him as wide of a berth as she can. And she's going to extend her hand out to Annalise um, to come towards her so she doesn't have to at least make that distance as well. The child stays. Don't do this. Please don't do this. I am begging you, please don't do this. I am protecting us. 
and he stares at you with all three eyes and all of that age and experience and whatever it is. Her courage and her resiliency is only going to carry her so far. I think she is... I think she's going to go for it. She's just going to claw clap her hand at Annalise again for her to come towards her. She doesn't say anything, but she's doing the hand thing. Just like, come here. So because you are directly contradicting the orders of your sire. Yeah. Who is also, you are also blood bonded to a one direction blood bond. Yeah. You're going to have to make a willpower roll. Which her willpower is super diminished after her fun times with Annalise. So, hi, can I make a terrible decision? Always. I'm going. Fuck it. All right. This is how we do this. I'm going to attempt to dominate Chase. Good luck. This whole room is about to get fucked, honey. All right, I got eye contact. I, I I would like to attempt to to dominate them. Do I? If I kill a person, that's bad. I mean, like humans aren't people, but this is like a real people. Which of your dominates are you using? Okay, cool. Yeah. Ah, fuck. Forgetful mind, right? Are you trying to erase his memory? Yeah, right? Wouldn't that be the best thing to do? Because I'm, I want to... I want to... Um, I, I, I want to get out of this situation alive and I don't want to be on the fucking run. So give me a rouse check first. Okay. Okay. So I'm hungrier than I was because I, I, I rolled a two on my rouse check. You failed your rouse check, which means you're not going to be able to rouse your blood to activate your powers. Realizing that my that I failed my blood check, uh, I just wanted to be, I'm just going to finish the rest of my sentence of like, so I guess you don't need me here and it's fine. So I'm just going to go like stepping towards Monica and also out. So I'm going to make a roll for him to see if he... Uh, susses out that you were trying to do something. Nah, nah, he's fine. He's cool. Stop rolling more dice. Chase cocks his head and looks at you. Were you trying to pull something, Rom the Shaman? Were you just trying to pull something on me? I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about. You asked me to come in here and mentally dominate somebody. So I was attempting to mentally dominate somebody. You do this little thing with with your fingers, Rom, when you're trying to get yourself ready for something. I noticed it on the boat, and some of your other clan members do that too, where you just sort of... You must have been paying really close attention on the boat, that I was doing something with my fingers when I was trying to get away with something. Well, it's easy to pick up when you know Malkavians. It's like you all have ADHD or something. Mm Mm-hmm. Sure you did. Okay. So he's going to cock his head. He's going to look at you. Says, you know what, Rom? I don't think you're going anywhere just yet. Passes his rouse check with a 10. There's a whole room, guys. And so you're going to roll as he is attempting to dominate you. You're going to give me an intelligence and resolve roll, which I'm sure you have both of those things. Okay, I have rolled four successes out of six die. I have eight. Oh, out that's of cool. ten. It's like that's I know that's like half. Mm-hmm. Can can I can I do something to get more successes? You're not going to be able to equal it because if you spend willpower, you can only re-roll two dice because that's all you have in your pool. Monica, help! You look at Chase as he says, I don't think you're going anywhere. And then he just says the word, stay. And you find yourself standing in place, unable to move. You cannot 
go anywhere. You can't even take a step forward as you are compelled to stand in place. I did the right thing. Yeah, just against the wrong character. But boy, did you do the right thing. So we're going to leave the two of you there for the moment. Marcus, you've made your way back from setting fires. Yeah. And you're back at the Haven, walking up to the doors, the Bruja on the doors open it for you, just as uh, Esmeralda and Sylvester come up very deep in discussion. Okay. Good evening. Oh, Voss, how's it going? How's it going, bud? Pretty good. I got a plan. I think it's a good plan. We better talk about this inside, though, Voss. It's... And he just makes a gesture that's like, eh, this isn't something for the street. Okay. Yeah, Marcus walks past you sort of into the building and you smell sweat, blood, and fire on him. Mm. The distinctive smell of gasoline as well. <laughs> Sylvester's just like, oh, somebody's never having a good time without Sylvester. Nah. <laughs> I want to set things on fire. <laughs> but that's part of my plan. I come into the front space and just sort of do a, a 180 at the small bar table that's nearby. And after the door closes, say, what's the score? The leader of the Ventru in the city is a rat bastard who's been selling us out to the hunters. He's not super happy about your little union endeavor. I've got proof that he's been talking to uh, this pastor fella, Fred. Fred. Who is another thing we're going to have to deal with, but I figured the Ventru first. I've got, look, to save you time, I've got his route down. I've got intel from Giovanni and the Nos. I've got his route. I've got a plan. Okay. What do you need from me? Borrow Esmeralda, and I'm going to need I don't need your blessing because I figure this is a masquerade breach and he makes a big open hand gesture like I've got to save a bit of face with the gangrel so I can't really go pulling folks in too many but I'm going to do something loud okay it's going to involve <laughs> and he, he like makes it like a, a little gesture like a tip of his head and raises his shoulders and he's like it's going to involve possibly fire at the very least, destruction. Part of my plan is making it so that there's no evidence of exactly what happened, so that, you know, any masquerade breach will be minimal. I, uh, I got this map, and he just reaches into a pocket, takes out a tourist's map of San Francisco, and lays it out on a table on the bar counter for you, and he's just like, all right, so look. <sighs> he's headquartered here. This is his office. Now, on a fairly regular basis, he goes over to pastor fred over here meets him at his church my plan is to hit him about three quarters of the way there about a quarter of the way back from there with an ambush and then i'm going to fucking kill him the only thing is he's while he's not mallet he's still an old ventru old enough to be a problem yeah so here's my plan he has a driver step one is that I put a bomb on this co street corner. Now, the driver will, will probably overreact to that if it goes off just right and veer over here to the left, cross lane traffic, most likely colliding with this car here. There will be one there. It's going to be there. And that car is going to be full of gasoline and explosives. Well, gasoline and farm fertilizer. I'm not even going to bother refining it into a bomb. Okay, so can I ask where this comes from? Why are you hunting the Venture Primogen? Let me stop. Let me take can I out of that statement. One, a masquerade breach. Secondly, I've agreed to do it for someone who... I can't tell you. Sorry, bud. But I've agreed to do this for someone. So you've agreed to do a hit 
a final death on a member of kindred society, you've told me that your plan is to breach the masquerade, which is an absolute fucking no-no in my territory, which you know. And you're doing it to to save face to your own primogen, whom I have an excellent, excellent relationship with at this point, at least as far as the face of it goes. And you want my help, the assistance of Clan Bruja to, to shit all over the rules, which is totally your thing, and then, you know, not be able to tell me who wants it done? How's that? How's that? Then I can't sanction it, and you don't get Esmeralda. And I have to tell you to figure out your own fucking problems. And he's just like looking down and he's biting his thumb. He's like, I really fucking can't tell this guy who who has given me this. <sighs> I'm not trying to put the screws to you, man, but like you, you're asking for a shitload and not giving me anything. Listen, I don't like Curtis either. He's a dick bag. But sanctioning a kindred hit and if if other kindred find out that essentially Clan Bruja is up for sale... And furthermore, up for sale without even knowing who's paying the invoice? No way. Listen, this this isn't Jersey. It's not the fucking Sopranos here. Spencer's just like looking down. You're just talking. He's like, yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you, bud. <sighs> Someone has something that I need. And I don't get that unless I do this. Okay. So, so what do you need? Intel. About a particular vampire a kindred of my own clan and I can't go asking within my clan because I tried that and nobody knows fucking shit or if they do they don't tell me now I am willing to give you whatever you need in terms of the intel I have showing off Curtis and his little indiscretion but I have made an agreement that I would kill him Okay, bud. Whatever is a big price. Do you think your body can cash that check? I'm not sure. That's why I haven't done it yet. Fantastic. Okay, I'm willing to play. Now that I know the odds, here are my guidelines that I'll require. First of all, it will not breach the masquerade. The two of you are smart enough to figure out how to not do that. If necessary... Members of other clans could be involved. I can think of one in particular who loves nothing more than poking their finger in the eye of the former scepter holders. And they can make things happen real fucking quiet. So no bombs. <laughs> Sylvester's like, oh. <laughs> Curtis is nice and strong. All Ventru are strong in purpose. Their bodies take a whole lot of punishment. But that said, there might be enough strength in the clans around here to be able to hold one down. And with the evidence that they've been speaking to mortals, if that's concrete enough to prove that they've been breaching the masquerade, well, final death is the curtain call for breaking the masquerade usually. And so I feel a little better about that. Okay. I'm going to speak with someone and we're going to get a little bit of intel on this position. I don't mind your mapping of it, but there might be a way to drag Curtis into some place less than fortunate. Maybe we use the car. Maybe that's a fantastic idea. It's not loaded with explosives. All it is there is is a common everyday traffic jam and then a nearby sewer hole or something like it could be used to, well, you know, drag his ass to the hell that is the sewers of San Francisco. After which, Lord knows what might happen to him, but it would happen out of sight. (sighs) All right. All right. You you should try the country sometimes, Marcus. You can just fucking kill a guy out there and nobody sees. It's great. All that said, I'm happy to assist you. And then uh, at some point, I'll knock on your door and I'll ask for help for something and you'll help and you won't know who's paying the invoice. Fair. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. And there won't be any questions asked. No, 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 there won't be. 
Esmeralda, help him with everything he needs. I'm going to put you in touch with Gene, and we're going to work something out for our masquerade breaking venture primogen. You got it. And she cracks her knuckles. I, uh, I give a nod to uh, in the direction of um, our favorite goblin, Sylvester, and I walk down the hallway. So you walk out of the conference room as it's become at this point and Jean is there in the hallway she's coming out of another room and she looks at you smells the smoke nods she says we got problem let's talk she hands you a poster just a piece of paper a flyer have you seen this child at the top and a picture of a tiny Tremere that you have seen before. I shake my head. This is more of Mallet's legacy playing out now. I was hoping we'd get away with her, at least, because Phoebe kept her locked up for so long. I was hoping maybe no one would know, but her face is splashed all over that part of town. Okay. Are we aware of where the child is? With Monica. Okay. I turn to my phone and I text Monica. I think you may be in danger. We need to talk. And you don't get a reply right away. Okay. Katarina, you came back with the intel that you gathered and with Vlad. You passed the poster off to Jean for her to do something with since she's the intel person here. But you still have that book. And just as you were heading upstairs with Vlad, you heard Marcus come in. Back from some adventure, you assume. Welcome home, Marcus. Oh, thank you. I paid a visit tonight to the Easton house. Understood. I paid a visit to the former Van Ness house. Oh, why? Because one of my patients at the clinic very likely saw the person who killed her. And I wanted to see if there was any evidence left of who that might have been. And was there? Not that I could find of the person, but I did find the, this. And I'll open my jacket and I will show him the book. So there's a, it's a small book. It looks like a, a handbound book, old. And there's a lot of smoke coming from it. There's some edges that look burned. It was near a fire at some point. And if, do you give him the book or, uh, or do you take it, Marcus? If she presents the book to me, then yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. I'll take it. Most of the pages are written in a very neat handwriting. There's bits in German, which you don't speak. Um, And there's a bunch of symbols, some of which you recognize from being around Tremere. Vince had a few of them painted in his murder dungeon the one time you were there. And just a whole lot of it looks like carefully collated handwritten notes. And then about three quarters through, it switches to English instead of German. There's still a lot of these symbols throughout and you can't read all of them, but there is that section in English about imbued weaponry. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I find it uh, likely very compelling, if not a bit technical. I mean, Marcus has no immediate dots in of cult because he hasn't been able to cultivate them just yet. But um, yeah, he, I mean, he might find it fascinating reading, but. Again, he's no Thurgist. He's no sorcerer. It does strike you for a moment, even if you're going to have to find a Tremere or someone to read this, because you remember the description of Esther with a sword. Certainly. Okay, Katarina. I think that it's it's interesting because it does potentially dovetail back to our other hunter issue, perhaps the, the core of the issue, but... We're working right now on ways of stripping all of uh, her wonderful protection aside, at least her physical protection. 
is. Well, I'm pretty sure that the patient saw her because she, because he told me that she had a very long sword and he was convinced that she was a heroine. Well, I mean, if nothing else, given the entomology of her name, certainly. How fitting for a heroic member of the hunter group to have something so biblically powerful as Esther. Uh, So at least she's from central casting, if nothing else. Okay, here's what we need to do. Uh, We need to get Rom uh, and get them over to speak to this person uh, uh, to help them, if nothing else, come to a better mental state. There's uh, Rama is talented in a lot of different ways, but clearly working with uh, people who have gone through trauma uh, is one of the things he most specializes in. And so I think that's the first step. Because if we know more about this Esther character, it might inform us a little bit more about how to approach them. Yes, and I had a very similar thought. I have Jean preparing them to be able to come over here so that if any of the others suspect that there is someone who saw her that survived, he's at least safe. Because the last thing we need is him dying or being kidnapped if they find out. Okay, so we need to be very careful about it then. Uh, So reach out to Ram and let's get the three of you together. You can play a mother to both of them if if need be. But we have to unlock the knowledge they're in if we're going to be able to use any sort of advantage over Esther. Yes, I will try to get a hold of Ram and see if we can't get him over here tonight and I will also contact Gene and see if we can't get him transported as soon as possible probably a good idea um, I would let you know just out of clarity of um, if we get a visit at some point in the future from a woman in her late 30s mid 40s suburban housewife who's um, a little glassy eyed and say hungry for something that she can't get from her husband anymore, I am 100% to blame. I feel like this is going to be a longer discussion. Uh, I chuckle. Let's just say that I paid a visit to Fred's house and I met his wife. And then I set his garage on fire. (laughs) Very good. I approve of this. Uh, The only other thing that is... I feel pertinent to mention because it was unusual is that the Venice house was partially burned but not completely torched to the ground. So after I ransacked it for lack of a better term, I finished that job. Very well. Any Tremere knowledge that you may have burned after taking these scraps is likely a proper method to heal the masquerade and it should be commended thank you I also took your concern seriously about our dear Sophie upstairs I'm going to give her a small reward in exchange for a little more information it would be best to find a way to give her a At least some method of normal mobility. Yes, that is the plan. I nod. Very well. Uh, I reach out for my phone. I'm still concerned about Monica and this child, especially if these flyers are making it into the hands of other members of Kindred Society at some point. Uh, That will be continued red flags. And let's face it, the... Well... Clan Slubri doesn't need any more enemies. No, and especially if, given how populated the party was at the gardens, if there were people that saw her there. 
Yes. How long are you going to wait to hear back from her before you go trying to find her? I sort of sigh. At least a few minutes. You know how I am. I I don't like to be kept waiting. No, I am better there. So speaking of Monica and Rom and creepy child, let's change the camera back over to the quote unquote safe house. Monica, you tried your hardest to resist your sire's order to leave the room and you couldn't do it. Your will is not as strong as his. He's your sire. You have a one-way blood bond with him, which gives him a lot of power over you. And you're also feeling depleted still after everything you took on in that healing ceremony. And as you turn and leave the room and you hear your sire compel Rom to stay, you get a just a brief tickle in your mind and you hear Annalise's voice inside your head saying go please Monica can't even look at her right now because she's being compelled to leave the room which she will comply with but she can't even look at her she doesn't know whether this communication streak is one way or two way Uh, she's going to think back to that same tickle she's just going to say I'm sorry Um, I think she is going to move directly at Ram, and she's just going to put two hands on their chest with almost like that, I'm really sorry. And then she's going to shoulder around them, and then she's just going to go into the hallway. And as you go into the hallway and you hear Annalise start to say something, you can't quite make it out, but she, the timbre of her voice has changed. You get a fucking text alert on your fucking phone. It better not be Justin. Well, it is actually. And it just says, you okay? It's quiet over there. Bad vibes. I think she's going to stare down at the phone with two trembling hands and she types out 911. And she thinks about that house and she thinks about the relationship that she has with Justin. And I think she's just going to hit delete three times. And I think she's going to type in F-I-N-E and hit send. You then get a second incoming text alert from Marcus as you move further down the hall because you feel this push to move away as far away from that room as you possibly can. And you get another incoming text alert from Marcus. I think every push is making her cry. I think the concern coming from across the street is making her cry. She's Upset isn't even scratching the surface to the levels of betrayal and pain and fear that she is feeling right now. I think she's going to look down to that text from Marcus as she's continually being pushed away. So at this point, she's probably pushed past the stairs and she's into the kitchen. She's wondering if she just got that child killed. Um, And I think when that thought hits and that text lands from Marcus, she's actually just going to immediately hit the call button. So, Marcus, you get a phone call after waiting just a couple minutes. I pick up the phone. Monica. We're at the house that you put aside for us. You can tell that she's crying. I don't want to overstep any boundaries here, but I I don't think you're safe. Rom's here. Is, Is Rom okay? I don't think so. Okay. I'm on my way. I hang the phone up. I stalk out of the office. As I stalk out of the office, I walk past Jean's office and I point into her office and I say, you on me, all your people with me now. She's actually coming out of the office and she says, Malarkey says something's wrong. I'm already getting like flushed. Like I can feel like all of my blood beginning to burn. I will sort of yell out into the air, uh, Katarina's name, Katarina. East, and I will come down the stairs. We're going on a road trip. I will hit the the front vault, the first vault door, open it, and then push really hard to move it open. They're heavy anyway, so I'm not trying to break it. Um, but if I see Esmeralda, and if Sylvester has not left yet, I locate them with my eyes, like beginning to sort of like boil red. And I will point to Esmeralda and say, you 
with me now. She just instantly snaps into crisis mode. We're heading over to the house where Monica and Chase are. Ron may be in trouble and Monica may be in trouble. Listen, we got to take care of this. There is a child involved here, a very young one and one that is now plastered all over the news. The Tremere kid, fuck. Okay. I don't know what the situation is. We're going to get on site and, and discover it. We're going. And Esmeralda bolts out the door, calling up a few people as she goes. And Jean is already slipping off into a shadow. You know, higher power Lissandra can shadow travel. And she's just gone. She doesn't even go for her car. She is just gone. Fantastic. Yeah. As soon as the car is ready, I hit the road. So as that's happening and Monica is making the call, Rom, I'm going to need you to make a second intelligence resolve. I only have six die. You could explode. Oh, yeah, that was good. That was a good roll. Mm -hmm. That was a really good roll. Holy balls. A three, a two, a three, a ten, a seven, and a seven. So you do not have enough. You are staring at him, unable to move, and he looks deep into your eyes, and he says, walk into the bay until you can't walk any further. Oh, fuck me. And stay there. And you feel compelled to walk out of the house and down towards the bay. That's cool. Can I adjust the speed at which I walk? <laughs> he didn't tell you how fast. We're just going to do, we're going to walk. It's going to be super casual. How far away is the bay? It's, it's going to be at least a 25 minute walk for you at a normal walking speed. Oh, thank God. I sure hope someone finds me. <laughs> Out you go down the driveway, down the street, headed in the direction of the bay. And Chase turns his attention to Annalise, and they are going to lock eyes, and we are going to have vam old vampire versus old vampire roll-off. As Annalise says, and Monica, you hear this as you get off the phone, I don't think you want to do that. And he says, I've been waiting to dispose of your kind for quite some time. I was going to do it the easy way, but you're making it difficult. And I think, based on this roll, there, by the time you get there, Marcus, as you roll up, they're still locked eyes with each other and neither of them are moving. Okay, so so when I arrive on scene, then I'm going to do my best to... First, I'm looking for Monica because I don't know what else is happening in the house. Um, so Monica's outside the the main living portion. She's, or she's out in the hallway or she's in the kitchen. She's in the kitchen, okay, yeah. yeah. So I find her first and I will... Um, get close enough to her to whisper because obviously I hear that there's a there's other I sense that there are other people in the house and I'll just say where what is going on what, what's happening I think Monica is trembling but the relief that she has when she sees your face is just something that would under any other given circumstances would lift the entire room uh, I think she's going to hug you desperately just kind of like run into you and hug you and she's going to step back he sent he sent Rom to the bay. He's dominated. He sent Rom to the bay maybe 15 minutes ago, and I think he's going to kill Annalise. Okay. Um, I, I will hug Monica back in a in a real way because Bruja are very passionate people. And she's going to get that moment of true appreciation and warmth, and he is going to whisper in your ear, I need you to go outside. She's going to pull back and she's going to look at him eye to eye. Her nose is probably just a foot away from his. And she's going to say with as much of a stable voice as she can, if you kill him, it'll kill me too. Okay. Okay. And she's going to push away from him. She's going to shoulder around him. She's going to probably topple into a wall and then she's going to exit out through the back. 
Okay. I go around the kitchen and walk into that room with the two of them. You walk into the room and the shadows are rippling around the living room and coming out of the hallway as Clan Lasombra melts into the house. And Monica, as you run out, Malarkey's standing outside the door waiting to catch you. He's like, uh, uh, I don't know what's going on, but c- come on, come on. I got you. I got you. Just, just come on. And he's going to try and lead you away over to House La Sombra. And so, Marcus, you move into that room and Esmeralda comes barreling through the door. Yeah, Sylvester's there too. He's showing up with Esmeralda. Sylvester and Esmeralda come barreling in through the door and you just see Chase and Annalise with eyes locked. Neither of them are moving. Annalise is sitting on the couch, clutching her dolls, but she's got this very adult, old look on her face. You see the 400 year old Tremere in this moment and Chase is cold and hard as ice. Their lips aren't moving, nothing is moving. It's almost like they're frozen, staring at each other. I'm, I'm going to sort of assess the situation and try to... So, I, I know that both of the clans, at least as far as what I'm aware of them, both have some sort of mental ability. Tremere, I know a little bit better than I know Salubri. And so, mm-hmm. I have seen vampiric uh, showdown, eye-to-eye showdowns before. Um, so, I probably would just put up a cautionary hand towards Esmeralda and I will motion with my fingers at my eyes uh, as sort of a remember remember the powers at work here and so then I will just as I'm setting my my own mental state up for this scene um, I'm going to begin training my, my brain to remember to look at throats and chins and to not give either one of these essentially blood wizards the ability to look me in the eye because that's what they want and i'll move on chase's side of the room slowly methodically and um i'll say to him i don't know what's going on here but the child needs to get brought to safety the child endangers us all And as he says that, you get a slight tickle in your brain. And you hear the child's voice. Marcus, do you allow her to speak to you telepathically or do you fight it? No way. Um, I will make a rouse check. Okay. That is an eight. I will spend a point of willpower. I will put myself into a frenzy and ride the wave of that frenzy. And gain a couple more dice against mental intrusion. So she is making a roll here against you with her telepathy. And you are going to roll wits plus subterfuge. Okay. She's already passed the rouse check to speak to you, which is how how you know it's her voice. I have five. Okay. She also has five. Okay. So I, I guess I will just say, is the message in an attempt in any way to direct me to do something? She doesn't seem like she's not implanting words. She's, she's asking a question, Marcus, as if asking permission to speak to you. She doesn't need your permission. Mm-hmm. You know this with, with telepathy. She, ne- she needs to beat you in order to read your mind. But she's asking if she can speak to you. All right. I'll... Uh... I suppose that I'll I'll let her speak to me. He wants me to go. Go where? Into the sunlight. He's been hurt. By who? Us. I can see his memories. We did bad things. Not me, but we. I don't want... I'm fighting... We're fighting each other. But we're both the same, I think. I don't want to kill him. I understand. I step closer to Chase. I say, Chase, if your plan is to kill this vampire, to kill Annalise, you understand you're going to break 
the rules of the masquerade here in my domain. I didn't want to originally. I didn't ask what you wanted. I want I want a yes or no question. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. I put a very small barrel gun to the side of his belly. Now, I don't know how much you know about firearms, but inside this gun is something called dragon's breath. You might be real, real sturdy, but my guess is you're not immune to fire, just like the rest of us. So I want you to think twice about breaking rules in my fucking house, which would be dishonorable for an elder like you who should know better. I'm going to make a roll for him. Okay. He doesn't break eye contact with Annalise, but you see both of them kind of relax their shoulders a little bit. And she speaks directly to him, not telepathically like she was to you a moment ago. I'm sorry, but I really don't like it when people try to kill me. Just for the record. And it wasn't me, you know. But if you try to dominate me again, you're going to be the one walking into the fucking sunlight. And you can see his shoulders tense up again, but neither of them makes a move. And you see one of the shadows melt out of the wall and kind of wrap around Annalise a little bit. You don't know if it's a protective gesture or a restraining gesture, but she doesn't move. Okay, Chase. Here's how this ends. I step a little bit sort of into the blind spot of that person, that body. And I say, here's the penance. First of all, your San Francisco privileges are over. Pack it up. You're gone. Secondly, I'm going to report this level of disrespect to the Union and to Elysium. We'll see how much the Keeper of Elysium appreciates you disrespecting the domain of San Francisco. Because if I'm going to hit you, I'm going to hit you socially. Right where it hurts. And if you have done anything, anything to Ram, I will come and find you. And there's nothing more I love than a good hunt. You can ask William Mallet. Annalise just says, I think he's walking into the bay right now. Annalise, honey, will you contact him and tell him to come back? I'll try. Thank you, sugar. Malkavians are really hard to talk to. You know, that's the best part about Ram is he's chatty as fuck. And you see her eyes kind of roll back a little bit and she settles back into the couch and she turns her head as if she's looking out the window. And I'm going to give her a roll. Oh boy, yeah. So she definitely gets through to you, Rom. So, Rom, you hear a (laughs) voice in your head saying, Hey, mister, snap out of it, please. Can I do that? And you're going to give me a resolve and subterfuge because you're trying to break through what he's planted in your mind. And you're going to have a lower level of difficulty because Annalise is in your head. Difficulty is three. All right. Well, that's two successes out of three. Do you want to spend a point of willpower and re-roll those failures? Okay. I'm going to roll. Wonderful. That's a 10 and a six. Oh, that's three then. So you are walking towards the bay. You can see it in the distance. You don't want to keep walking, but your feet won't stop moving. And then you hear this childish voice in your head telling you, don't do that. And it cuts through the fog in your brain. And you realize, wait, what the fuck am I doing? Why am I here? And you stop. And back at the house, Annalise rolls her head and says, I think he's okay. As okay as he can be. Okay. God, I love this city. I'll uh, I'll take a step back and keep the gun at the ready, but sort of, I guess, take it out of its threatening position. And then I'll say, okay, get out of my house. He bows slightly from the shoulders, an old-fashioned sort of bow. 
and he looks at the child and he turns and he walks away. And he gets in his car and Monica, you get a text saying, we're leaving. Where's Monica at this point? If you let him, Malarkey was going to pull you into House La Sombra. Yeah, that'd be To cry in a corner with all the cats. Uh, She's going to look at her phone for a moment with like this, this optimistic feeling of, oh, it might be Marcus. And it's not. And she looks at the phone and she looks up to Malarkey and she's going to reach up and she's going to kiss him with as much gratitude and sincerity as she could possibly muster. And she's going to put a hand on either side of his head. Uh, and she's just going to lean into him and she's going to say, I have to go. Is it safe? Uh, go uh, uh, go where? Are, are you okay? Uh, are you okay? She looks at him and I don't think she can give him a response. And she's just going to nuzzle into him again. Um, if she's okay, will you text me? I don't have a way of knowing if she's okay. Yeah. E- e- yeah. Just He looks confused. And a little sad and then confused again. Because there's definitely some finality about the way her tone is and her body language. She's definitely saying goodbye. She's just not articulating those exact words. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Tell Marcus I said thank you. Yeah. Um, watch your shadow. She smiles. Uh, she is going to hand him her phone. And then she's going to leave and go get in a car. As you go out to the car, you see this childish face looking out the window at you and at him. And you just hear, you feel that tickle in your mind and you hear, don't leave me. She doesn't have a choice. She's going to respond, I love you. And then she's going to turn her back on that face in the window. She's going to get into the passenger seat and she's going to close the door. Well... Time to go. And I think that is where we will leave tonight's episode. Thank you all very much for listening to our very dramatic evening. I hope you will tune in next time. Thank you and good night.